Well, it is November. It is Pledge Month. We're going to talk a little bit about handling your money scripturally. To start out with a story, there was a couple named Sue and Bob, a pair of tightwads, admittedly, lived in the Midwest many years ago and had been married for years. Bob had always wanted to go flying. The desire deepened each time a barnstormer flew into town to offer rides. Bob would ask, and Sue would say, no way, $100 is $100. The years went by, and Bob figured he didn't have much longer, so he got Sue out to an air show, explaining that it's free to watch, let's at least watch. And once he got her there, the feeling became very strong, and Sue and Bob started an argument. The pilot between flights overheard them and listened to the problem, and he said, I'll tell you what. I'll take you up flying, and if you don't say a word, the ride will be free on me. But if you make one sound, you pay $100 each. So they agreed to the deal, and off they flew. The pilot did as many rolls and dives as he could, headed to the ground as fast as the plane would go, and then pulled up out of the dive at the very last second. Not a peep, not a word. Finally, the pilot admitted defeat and went back to the airport. He said, I'm surprised you didn't say anything. How did you keep so quiet? Well, Bob responded, I almost said something when Sue fell out, but $100 is $100. <laughs> Some people really like to hang on to their money, regardless of the situation. As I said, November is Pledge Month, and we use the members' pledges to prepare our church budget for the next year. So it's an important uh, piece of our planning. Uh, and I think most pastors are probably very careful about how they preach about money for fear that everyone in the congregation will say to themselves, uh-oh, here we go, or they roll their eyes, another money grab by the church, and, and you know, the pastors don't want to turn the uh, people away. And, you know, Because unfortunately, there are some people out there on TV or on the radio, and it seems like just about every, you know, if they have a half an hour show, 15 minutes of it is begging for money in one form or another, and uh, the other half, maybe they get a little bit of teaching in. And, uh, if you've been coming to this church for any length of time, you know that I very rarely talk um, about uh, money in a sermon. And uh, I try never to plead or beg for it around the offering. I just say the offering is going to be received and put in what you, whatever you prayerfully put in. But since it is Pledge Month, uh, we do want to talk a little bit about that. And it's important because it's in the Bible. You realize that the Bible contains 500 verses on prayer, 500 verse, actually a little less than 500 verses on faith, more than 2,000 verses on money and possessions. So it must be important. 15% of everything Jesus ever taught on the topic was on the topic of either money and possessions, more than his teachings on heaven and hell combined. Must have been important to him as well. So we shouldn't ignore it, so we might as well just look at it in the eye and talk about it this morning. And it must be something that is important to us as Christians to handle our money scripturally. Because the world will give you plenty of options on how to handle your money unscripturally. We were talking a little bit about that in our Sunday school class this morning. About how some cases there have been scam artists, even within a church, who have taken money from church members and have squandered the money in pyramid schemes and other uh, ways. And uh, you know when they thought they could trust a fellow church member. So it's important that we are careful with the money that we have. So let's talk a little bit about that this morning. And don't worry, I'm not here to shame you or make you feel guilty about your giving. I want to emphasize again, as I've mentioned uh, multiple times over the past years, I have no idea how much any of you give in the course of a year. I don't look at the offering sheets. I don't look at the sheets at the end of the year that you get your statement for your income taxes. Uh, so I have no idea how much who gives. I don't know who the biggest giver is in a church. I don't know who the smallest giver is. I don't know who tithes. I don't know who does what. But all I know is that I look at the overall offering and our expenses, and we try to try to match them up as best as we can. If we have a little more offering than expenses, well, then we put that in our, one of our savings accounts, and we use that for building repairs or for the new building or uh, for the benevolence fund or the youth account or whatever we might uh, be saving money for at that time. So uh, don't worry. I'm not going to be. If you feel like I'm preaching directly at you this morning, not me. So don't worry about that. I'm not looking at anybody in particular. But it's important that we talk about it. As I said, Jesus spent 15% of his time talking about money or possessions, so it must be important. If it's important to Jesus, it ought to be important to us this morning. Well, the first thing that we want to recognize is that God owns everything. Anything you own, any money in your wallet, any money in your bank account belongs to God. Any money you receive in your paycheck belongs to God. We don't need to covet. In fact, we shouldn't covet it. And we are not to cover, covet what does not belong to us. That's part of the Ten Commandments. 
including our neighbor's possessions or our neighbor's wife, but the money doesn't even belong to us as well. It's on loan from God, basically. It's a tool that he's allowing us to use to pay our bills and maybe with a little extra to help other people as well. But the money really, as a Christian, we understand doesn't belong to us. Because guess what? When we leave this earth, the money's still going to be here. So it's just going to go on to somebody else. It's nothing that we can permanently keep. Only the treasures that you store up for yourselves in heaven are yours to keep for all eternity. I'm going to read a number of scriptures this morning, so I don't expect you to flip through and follow all of them as we go through. You might want to write them down if you want to refer to them later on. But God owns everything. In Deuteronomy 10, 14, Behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens is the Lord's, thy God. The earth also, with all that is therein. Everything. Psalm 24, 1, The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, the world, and they that dwell therein. So not only everything in the earth, but us. We are the dwellers of the earth. The animals are also dwelling on the earth. The fish in the sea, they all belong to God. Ezekiel 16, 17, Thou hast also taken thy fair jewels of my gold and of my silver, which I had given thee, and madest to thyself images of men that didst commit whoredom with them. And he is admonishing the nation of Israel when they made the false idols. And he said, You used my gold, you used my silver, you used my jewels, and you made idols to false gods. The gods that didn't make those things. Yet I made them, and yet you gave them to somebody else. You offered them up to somebody else. But the point there is that everything that we have, the money that we have that's backed by gold, is still something that God created. So everything we have, all the, all the financial wherewithal that we have, is God's. It belongs to God. So God owns everything. Number two, God provides us with what we need. In Genesis 22, 14, And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh. That means the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. So God owns everything, and God provides to us, out of everything that he owns, what we need. 1 Chronicles 29, 12, Both riches and honor come of thee, and thou reignest over all. And in thine hand is power and might, and in thine hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all. So God has the power to provide you with everything you need, whether it's money in a paycheck, or whether it's money from an inheritance, or whether it's cash from some other an investment, whether it's a gift from somebody to you. We just are celebrating uh, the birthday uh, recently, and so the recipient received gifts. Well, that's fine. Somebody may give you a, a financial gift, which is all well and good also, but it all ultimately came from God. And that money is only worth anything, the paper it's on, because of the, what God created, the gold standard behind it, so that the money is worth something. So God provides. He owns everything, and he does provide to you. It makes you kind of pause when you think about, what am I doing with the money that God has given me? What am I spending it on? Go back and look at your checkbook register and see where you spent your money over the past month or over the past year. Does that honor God? Does that honor God? Does, oh, I wonder if that probably doesn't honor God. Go down that list. And how many of those things outside of your normal bills, electric, uh, oil, gas, whatever it might be, telephone, that sort of thing, and then the, the, the stuff that you have a little extra left over at the end of the month that you can just kind of spend as you see fit. And God has no problem with you spending a little money on yourself from uh, having a few things that are nice every now and then. There's nothing wrong with that as long as you don't covet those, as long as you don't idolize those, as long as that doesn't become more important to you than God himself. But what is it that you're spending the money on? And some of those things, if you think about it in terms of, would God be happy that I purchased this? might be embarrassing if you take a look at that closely. So God owns everything, God provides everything, and the Bible encourages us to seek spiritual riches instead. In Proverbs 28, 20, A faithful man shall abound with blessings, but he that maketh haste to be rich shall not be innocent. If your whole purpose in life is to get more, and more than the person next to you, it says there, you shall not be innocent. You will be guilty of putting that before God. What should be our overriding and all-consuming desire in this life? It should be to please God. We have a relationship with God as Christians, and now we should do everything in our life. Every one of our thoughts and our waking moments ought to be, how can I bless God? How can I worship God? How can I support uh, the ministry? How can I be a blessing to others in the name of Jesus? And if we start focusing on ourselves, and I know some of these people, and all of this is about money. I've got to get more, got to get more. Any of you uh, ever watch some of these reality TV shows where they're flipping a house or they're in a pawn store or something like that, 
It's amazing how narcissistic, by the way, some of these folks are, and I guess that's how they get a TV show, a reality TV show. But how many times have you heard, it's not just one of these shows, but many of these shows where it's all about the money. If they're flipping a house, well, you want to make money, of course. I mean, that's just prudent. That's just good stewardship. But they talk about, you know, cutting corners here and there. And uh, they, get, they yell at their workers. And you spent an extra hour doing what? Well, I wanted to make it look nice. But that's cost me money. That cost me an extra $100 when you did that or you broke something. And they get very angry. And they use a lot of foul language sometimes, uh, which are bleeped out of these shows. But you can tell how angry they are because it cost them an extra 100 bucks. They're going to make $20,000 on the deal, but you cost them an extra 100 bucks. Or if they're in the pawn shop and, uh, you know, the, the uh, people in the pawn shop say, well, it's all about money. That's what's most important. we got to turn everything around. And they try to, of course, they try to lowball you, and that's part of their business. You try to get the best deal you can and then negotiate, hopefully, somewhere in the middle. But, uh, again, same kind of thing. They talk about wasting extra money, and they're down to the dollar, wasting an extra dollar, and that's all consuming to them. So is that that important to you in your life? You have to be careful about that. Riches and honor come of thee, and thou reignest over all. Riches and honor come from God. We have to understand that. And in thine hand is power and might, and in thine hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all. So God not only gives you financial wealth and power, but he also gives you political power and social power, community power. So the Bible encourages us to seek spiritual riches. In 2 Corinthians 9, 6, But this I say, He which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. So, God looks at your heart. We talked about that in a number of other instances. God knows if you're a tightwad in your heart. He knows if you're a generous person by your nature. God desires to bless generous people because he knows they will in turn be generous with what he gives them. If on the other hand, if you like to pinch the penny so tight that it looks like it was run over by a train. You ever put a penny on a railroad track and it spreads out? If that's the way you pinch your pennies, then God is going to say, well... They've got all the money, you know, that they've ever earned, their first dollar they ever earned. Why should I give them any more? They're not going to do anything to further the kingdom. They're not going to bless somebody else with a, a gift, a financial gift, or, or bless the church and the offering or anything like that. They're just going to hoard it to themselves. So why should I give them any more? All right, so now everybody's first thought again would be, well, but look at some of the wealthiest people in the earth. They're godless people, many of them. Well, that's true. We were doing a story this uh, week on the radio, the wealthiest people, People in the country, in the world, the, the richest billionaires. Bill Gates is the richest, eighty some point some odd billion dollars. In spite of all that he gave away, Warren Buffett was up there, and some of the one, ones that are well known. Uh, Sam Walton of Walmart fame, his daughter is the richest woman. Uh, I forget how many it's thirty some odd billion dollars that she owns uh, and has through inheritance, and it goes on down from there. I don't know about the spiritual tenor of any of those people. Uh, all I know is what I read, but that's for God to judge, not for me. What good is any of those billions of dollars going to do for them when they're in hell? That's just cut right to the chase. What good will it do for them? They're going to enjoy it for 60, 70, or 80 years, and then they die and will have nothing and will never have anything for the rest of eternity. So what good does it do for them? Unless they're a Christian, and if they're using it to further God's kingdom, well, then God will bless them with even more. But where do they get their money if they didn't get it from God? Well, there is a still a God of this world. And there is a God of this world who does and has the ability to funnel money to certain people knowing that that money, first of all, will not be used for God's purposes because it's given to an ungodly person. So if Satan, the God of this world, can funnel as much money to people he knows who will not use it to further the kingdom, well, that just plays right into his purposes. Why would Satan want us to have money when he knows that we will use the money to be a blessing to other people? Well, we know that we will use it to proclaim the gospel message. We will use it to fund uh, TV ministries and radio ministries and, and books and magazines, and we will fund it to expand churches so that we can reach out more people or establish Christian schools or do whatever it is that we, God lays on our hearts to do. Satan doesn't want us to use that, but it takes money to do that. And so he's going to try to funnel as much of the money that he controls to people who will not use it for that purpose. But there's a God who's greater than the God of this earth. And that, of course, is the God of the universe. That is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit. And he ultimately controls everything. And he asks us to step out in faith. And there are Christian millionaires and multimillionaires, even if we don't personally know any. Maybe some of you do. Uh, and, but think, think about the, uh, the Green family, uh, the ones that own the, uh, the hobby stores in Oklahoma, Hobby Lobby. And they just had the big... Uh, Supreme Court case because uh, the uh, Obamacare was forcing them to try to provide abortifacients to their employees as part of their health care package. They won that case. 
through lots of prayer, but it is a multi, multi-millionaire Christian family, and they fund Christian uh, missionaries and Christian organizations all around the country and all around the world. So God does uh, bless people, and he knows he can trust them with that kind of money to be a blessing to others. So the Bible encourages us, however, to seek spiritual riches. If we seek spiritual riches, then it shouldn't matter to us how much money we actually have, because we have the most important riches. He which sows sparingly, or he who is a tightwad, will not reap much, but he who is generous will reap bountifully. So concerning borrowing, a lot of people say, well, that's a way, that's a path to riches. So, you know, you, you get some friends maybe to go with you. you got a great idea, the next great mousetrap. You get some friends to lend you some money. You, you establish a company. The idea is that once the company gets established and becomes profitable, you pay your friends back with interest. That's uh, ideally how it works, understanding that 80% of all businesses fail in the first five years, 80%. So if you have a friend who comes to you and says, I got a great idea, you know, those the guys in that Shark Tank uh, TV show have nothing compared to what I got. This is gonna be the next great uh, Frisbee. This is gonna be the next great hula hoop. This is gonna be the next great toy that anybody's ever gonna want, the next great red wagon. And so all you gotta do is say, hey, give me a couple thousand dollars to get started. I just need to you know, get some plans together, need to find somebody to manufacture, need some marketing capital. And they may get uh, maybe half a dozen or a dozen of their friends, and they may come to you, maybe it's a family member, which is a little harder sometimes to say no to. Hey, lend me $10,000, I'll pay, I'll pay you $15,000 back in a year or in two years or something like that. Here's, your, here's my advice. First of all, don't ever lend money to anybody with the expectation that you'll get it back or that you have to get back. If you're going to lend money to somebody, do it with the idea that I'll never get it back. If I do, bonus. That's wonderful, but I'm not going to expect it back. But the Bible has something to say about handling your money scripturally when it comes to loans. In Proverbs 22, verses 7 and 26 and 27, it says, Just as the rich rule the poor, so the borrower is servant to the lender. So you have put yourself in a subservient position to the person who has lent you money, because now you're indebted to them. Now, notice what the Bible does not say. The Bible does not say anywhere, don't lend any money to anybody. But it just says, it's a warning. Understand that you have put yourself voluntarily in a subservient position to that person. They now have some control over you. They have mastery over you when it comes to that loan. In verses 26 and 27, don't agree to guarantee another person's debt or put up security for someone else. In other words, it's saying, don't co-sign. Now, that's tough. Again, parents are often the first ones that are asked to be co-signed by their 16-year-old child who wants to go out and get their first car, and they ask the parent to co-sign. Well, again, parents, it doesn't say don't co-sign, but it warns you that, and it may depend, you know your child better than anybody else, or are you ever going to get that money back? Or is your child, because so the deal typically is the child says, Mom, Dad, if you'll co-sign for me, I'm going to get a job, I'll make my car payments, I'll make my insurance payments. Sometimes if mom or dad can afford it, and they're really generous, they'll say, you make your car payments and we'll pay for your insurance. So they make some kind of deal like that. Well, that's between you and your children. But what if child age 16 works for a while and decides, eh, I don't really like getting up early on Saturday mornings and going to work. Or, you know what, school is so overwhelming. I really got to do good. and I just can't do that and work part-time, you know, a couple nights a week at the local fast food store or whatever. And they quit their job. Or what if your kid is a goof-off and they get fired? None of our kids here in this church, of course, but it happens out there. I've heard stories out there. And they get fired, and they don't get another job. And all of a sudden, you've co-signed. You're now, you're the parent, you're on the hook for that. Don't co-sign that unless you know you can afford to make those payments along with any other bills you've got. So it's a warning. But it says there, uh, just as the rich rule the poor, so the borrower is servant to the lender, don't agree to guarantee another person's debt or put up security for someone else. If you can't pay it, even your bed will be snatched from under you. In other words, they'll come after you because you're the one who's now responsible. Credit cards are another thing. Now, by the way, I've mentioned many times that I'm preaching to myself as much as I preach to you, and this one is preaching to me as well. So I'm, I'm right in there with you. If you have any debt, uh, I'm right there with you. So if you can't pay it, it says even your bed will be snatched from under you. Again, don't go into debt and pledge anything that you can't afford to lose. Now it's again tough. This is a different time when this was written 2,000 years ago because if you want a house, you have to almost always have to take out some sort of mortgage. What happens if you don't pay your mortgage? They will literally take your bed right out from underneath you, ultimately through a sheriff's sale, and you'll lose your house. So 
We take out you know, mortgage insurance and some other things which tack on more money at the end of the month as well. And some people, I've met a couple people, uh, and I remember one, from, uh, one guy from college who uh, said that he's never going to take out a mortgage. He'll live in apartments. Uh, if it takes 30 years to save up money for a house, that's what he'll do. But he will never buy his first house unless he can buy it with cash. And we all said, God bless you, brother. And we all went and took mortgages for our houses and probably after graduation. But that's the point. It says, unless you're willing to lose whatever it is that you've pledged and, uh, you know, against a loan, then don't do it. Don't pledge it. So borrowing is advised against in the Bible, although I would venture to say almost everybody here this morning probably has some kind of debt somewhere. If you don't, then God bless you and stay out of it. Don't, don't get into it in the first place. Tithing. All right, so what about tithing? Any of you familiar with Larry Burkett? Uh, Larry has gone on to be with the Lord a number of years ago, but he started an organization, a Christian organization called Crown Financial Ministries. I actually taught one of his Sunday school, he had put together lots of curriculum, taught one of his Sunday school classes in the church that we belonged to when we lived in Oklahoma. Wonderful resource, you can go online, lots of great ideas. Uh, he's one of the ones, first ones that actually went through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and counted up all the verses that have to do with money and possessions and came up with uh, the 2,000 some odd verses in the Bible about that. Uh, he was a financial, he was more of a money manager. I wouldn't call him a financial planner because he didn't take money and invest it for people, but he was a financial money manager. He helped you manage your money in such a way that would honor God, that would be in a Christian, do that. So I encourage you, if you have any questions about money, to go to Crown Financial, I think it's crownfinancialministries.org or maybe crownfinancial.org, but you do a search on that, you'll, you'll find it. And just pages after pages and pages, not just for us individually, for Christians, Christian business owners, people who want to do some investing, and he even has a recommendation, if you have some additional money, he says it's all right to invest it in stocks and, and bonds, a few things, but there are certain things that you want to be careful about, and depending on how risk adverse you are, there are certain companies you do not want to invest in. As a Christian, it would not be prudent to invest in companies that uh, perhaps, uh, you know, produce something that uh, would cost people money, that would cheat people money. Uh, that would be promoting a vice, for example. But then there are other some good Christians, some good organizations like the Hobby Lobby. I don't even think that's even a publicly held company, but those that, uh, that are that are run by good moral principles, and they have a whole list of those that you can. If you have some extra money, you want to invest in those. You can do that as well. Anyway, Larry uh, Burkett had a lot to say about tithing. Some of it may be surprising to you, because I was looking that up uh, this week as I was preparing the sermon. Now, first of all, let's go to the verse that everybody's familiar with about that. It's in the Old Testament in Malachi, chapter three, verses eight to ten. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, wherein have we robbed you, God? You robbed me in tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse. For you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open, uh, open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And so most uh, churches, most Orthodox churches, encourage tithing, 10%. All right, so the next question is, was well, that 10% of your take-home pay or is that 10% of your gross? Ah, uh -huh. everybody say, well, 10% uh, of my take-home pay would be less. I heard somebody on TV one time say, well, you want God to bless you out of his net or bless you out of his gross? This was a TV preacher one time. So he was obviously trying to get his church to say 10% of the gross. So if you earn $100 a week and uh, you actually get to take home about $75 of that, and uh, people say, all right, well, then I'm going to pay $7.50. That's 10% of the $75 I get to, get to uh, actually take home. Others will say, well, no, I got paid $100. Uh, uh, I'm going to give the first tenth to God, $10 belong to God. The government gets the next 25%, and then I'll get to live on the rest. All right? So those are the two arguments about that. Larry Burkett had an interesting take on it, and I've heard this from many people as well. He says that is an Old Testament law, that the tenth is not specifically mentioned in the New Testament. But God says, what should we desire, but most of all, that we should desire to please God and God loves a cheerful giver. And some of you can't be cheerful if you're giving 10%. <laughs> some of you may cringe a little bit having to give that much. And it's interesting. The more money that we have, typically the harder it is for people to tithe. If you make $1,000 a week, that's $52,000 a year. That's a pretty decent income for most people. But then you have to give $100 a week to the church. Well, it'd be a little, interesting, a little easier if I made, you know, $100 a week and only have to give $10 to the church. 
What if I made $10,000 a week? I have to give $1,000 a week to the church if I'm a tither. It's a little tougher to do that. Remember when Jesus was watching the people give money and alms to the synagogue when they came in and the, the widow had a mite, less than a penny's worth, but that was all she had. Jesus is watching people putting, in today's uh, you know, verbiage, hundreds of dollars, twenties, hundreds, maybe thousands of dollars into the temple treasury. Didn't say a word. This little widow comes in, has nothing but a mite, a fraction of a penny, put it in. Jesus commented, she put in more than everybody else because she put in all that she had. And she wanted to bless God with that. Now, we're not asking you to give 100%. She gave 100%. But you know what? I'll guarantee you, and we'll see that widow when we get to heaven, that she never went hungry another day of her life. She had every single thing she ever needed every day of her life. She may have never been wealthy in the world's terms, but I guarantee you she never wanted for anything any need for the rest of her life because she was blessed because she gave God everything. When you commit your heart to the Lord, what are you really doing? You're giving everything that you are, your every essence to God. Your heart, your mind, your soul, your body. You're giving everything to God. Remember, God owns it all in the first place anyway. He created you. He's the one who put breath in you. So you belong to God. The money belongs to God. And Larry Burkett is saying that the tenth is a marker that was used specifically in the Old Testament, but that really shouldn't necessarily be the, the line in the sand where you only get 10% and period. That's it. God doesn't get a penny more. He suggests you give as God gives to you. And if you can give more than 10%, well then by all means go give more than 10%. Give 20%. Give 50% if you can afford it. On the other hand, we find out that there are sometimes there are people who become Christians. They'll come to the altar and uh, they are convicted. They genuinely give their heart to the Lord and they want to start living their, heart, their, their lives right. But up until this point, they have squandered all their money. They've gone deep into debt. And they couldn't pay 10%, give 10% if they wanted to because there's literally not enough money. They have maxed their paychecks out and they might even be working second and third jobs and they do not have, literally do not have 10% at the end of the week or the end of the month to give to the church. Larry Burkett says, that's okay. Because we are to be a testimony to the, to the, to the world. And we have pledged our hand uh, to somebody, perhaps maybe another non-Christian says, if you give me this loan, I will pay you back. I will sign up for this contract and I will pay you so much a month. And that is a testimony. You know, Christians should always pay their bills on time. It's a testimony that we are uh, doing what we have said. Our word should be our bond. The Bible says, let your yes be yes, let your no be no. And if you have pledged to somebody that you will pay them back a certain amount, or that if you have a phone bill that you will pay your phone bill every month, or pay your Pico bill every month to the electric company, then you should do that. Some people may lose their jobs. Maybe you were doing fine, you could give money to the church, but a sudden job loss, and all of a sudden you do not have... 10% left. Well, he says it's more important that your testimony be true to the world than God getting his 10%, quote unquote, for that particular week or month or six months or whatever period of time until you get through that. But it's important in your testimony to do so. Give what you can. And if you can give 1%, well, then give 1%. He taught uh, another principle at one time. He says, for people like that who are starting out, you know, you know what? As a family, we know that we should give 10%. Praise God. We have our electricity back. <laughs> Go get the... There we go. Now we can see it. Now you can see it. Sorry about that. Um, if you want to turn the... Uh, I might already be on. There we go. All right, you don't have to record anything. So, if, uh, if God... Uh, if, if you're convicted and you want to start giving something to the church, he suggested stepping up to the tithe. Uh, and uh, so when he said, well, if, see, the Christian life is really about self-discipline. When you think about it. Everything we do, we should have discipline. The words that come out of our mouth. We don't talk the way that we do before we became a Christian. We don't use that kind of language. We don't tell those kind of jokes. It takes some discipline because if you're in the habit of using those kinds of words or talking about those kind of jer jokes, you might have to catch yourself. Again, it's interesting on the radio, every once in a while, there's one guy I'm thinking of in particular, he's a political uh, consultant, and he's on the radio with us every Monday uh, morning, and talks about politics and whatever it is. If you talk to him off the air, he's got a pretty filthy mouth, frankly. But on the air, he knows that he can't say certain words on the air because the FCC will pull your license. And every once in a while, he gets kind of riled up about it, and he starts to say something, and you, can, you can hear him catch himself. I mean, literally, you start to say something, I can't... And he realizes he's on the radio and he can't say that. 
Well, he's kind of disciplined himself, at least as far as the radio goes, but as a Christian, we should be under a self-discipline all the time. Disciplined in what we eat. I'm now working with a nutritionist because I have to be more disciplined in the kinds of foods that I eat. I went to a nutritionist a week and a half ago at the behest of my doctor, and uh, she said, do a food diary for about three or four days before you come see me for the first time. So I wrote down everything that I ate, and uh, I was, to be honest with you, I was tempted to kind of behave myself for a couple of days leading up to that. But my wife said, no, 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 no you don't, you're not going to do that. You just eat like you would have normally eaten anyway. So I had my pizza, and I had my fast food, and I had my desserts, and whatever it was. And so I gave her the diary on the first day, and she looked at that, and she said, and I quote, this is a professional nutritionist who does this all the time. This is one of the worst diets I've ever seen in my entire life. <laughs> so, she put me on a different plan, which I've been pretty good, I think, sticking to, and I'll see her again this, this coming week. Discipline, though. Discipline in what you say, discipline in what you eat, discipline in how you dress, discipline in what you do and how you interact with other people, discipline in reading your Bible every day, discipline in praying every day, <coughs> discipline in spending your money. It's all about self-discipline. But, again, if you're a brand new Christian, you had no discipline, self-discipline before that, you just physically may not be able to give 10%, and that's okay. God understands that. He's not going to hold, hold a sword over you and say, oh, you didn't get 10% and not pay your electric bill. God is not unreasonable like that. But he does want you to start. He wants you to start somewhere. So anyway, there was a step up to tithing. And uh, the one church just said, well, you know what? If you can give 1% this next year, pledge 1%. So if you make $1,000 a week, instead of giving $100 a week, give $10. Try something. If you can't do that, give $5, but discipline yourself to give something. If you can put a few coins of loose change in the plate every Sunday, discipline yourself to do that. Try 1%. If you can do that, that's great. That's your pledge for the year. God bless you. Next year, try 2%. Next year, try 3%, and in 10 years, you'll be up to the tide. But however, God may decide to bless you because he starts to see the discipline in your life and you may start with 1%, 2%, and maybe by the third year you can jump it up to 5%. And then maybe 6%, and maybe you can jump it up to 9%. And it may not take you 10 years to get to that point. God loves a cheerful giver, and God will trust those that he has been able to find in the past that he that is find to be trustworthy. So if he trusts you with, and you're trustworthy and with 1%, watch God bless you to give you enough to give a little bit more. And if you are faithful to do that, he'll give you a little bit more. God desires to bless those who bless other people. But if you hoard it all for yourself and you're not blessing anybody else, then don't expect God to give you uh, great riches untold. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. Now about the collection for the Lord's people. Do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, hey, that's here, that's today, it's Sunday. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money and keep you with your income, Saving it up so that when I come, this is Paul talking, no collections will have to be made. So what he's saying is that Paul said, I'm going to come, I'm going to come visit you, churches there in Corinth. Start laying a little bit of, aside a little bit of money now on that first day of the week when you're meeting. In other words, when you take an offering, set aside a little bit for me when I get there so I have something that I can live on, so I don't want to be a burden on anybody. Or worse yet, he says, when I get there and you have no means to put me up, you have no way to feed me, and you're scrambling around begging people for money. You know, the great apostle Paul, the, the, the man who's come and, and preached for us, uh, says, uh, you know, we need, a, we need a place all of a sudden to, to house him. We need to give him some food and nobody's got any money. And, and so forth. he says, don't put yourself in that kind of panic. Plan ahead for those needs. Here's a verse that everybody I think is pretty familiar with out of Luke 6.38. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure. Press down, shaken together. Running over shall men give into your bosom, for with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. Reminds me of a science teacher one time who was wanted to talk about mass and density. And the difference is, remember that in your high school science, the difference between mass and density? So he had a big bottle of rocks, good-sized rocks, and he filled it up to the top. He said, all right, class, is this glass full of rocks? And all the class, oh, yes, it's full of rocks. Can't put any more rocks in there. Nope, can't put any more in there. Otherwise, we'll go over the top. So then he had a, a, a bag of small pebbles. And he started pouring that into the same glass where the bigger rocks are, and he was able to get a lot of those little pebbles in there, right up to the top. And of course the class all kind of, oh, you, okay, you got it, so I understand that. All right, now is it full? Yes, now it's full because you not only have the big rocks, you have the small pebbles in there. Then he took out a bag of sand, and he started pouring sand in there, and shaking it down, and, and, and putting it down there, and he got a lot of the sand inside there, 
And of course the class, oh, all right, you got us this time, uh, teacher, so yeah, we understand, okay. So he gets real small, and there's nothing smaller really than a grain of sand, so now he holds it up and says, fine, all right, now it's a fool. Yes, okay, now it's full. Then he pulled out a beaker of water. He started, started pouring the water inside of that. Making the point that there's a difference between density and mass, of course, the mass was the, the side, the volume, the density kept getting denser and denser because he was filling that up. Well, it says right here, this is kind of a science experiment, if you will, Luke 6.38, Give and it shall be given unto you good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and then running over. So it's not just filled up with big rocks and that's all you get. But he's going to press it down, he's going to shake it together, he's going to continue to pour it into you. And until it does run over, shall men give into your bosom, for with the same measure that you use or that you give out, it shall be measured to you again. In other words, if you're going to be a tight wad and a skin flint to other people, people are going to be a tight wad and skin flint towards you. But if you're generous to other people, the generosity is going to come back to you. You're going to reap what you sow. And finally, in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. God loves it when you give cheerfully. And if you only give a half of a percent, but you give it cheerfully, God loves you for that. If you give, He would rather you give a half of a percentage of your income cheerfully, like that widow, although she gave 100%, but He would rather you give pennies cheerfully than give 10% grudgingly with a bad attitude, grumbling all the way. That church there for a money grabber, all right, here's my check for 10%, I don't, you know, and going about your way. He would rather you give the penny cheerfully than the $1,000 with a, as a grouch. Every man as he purposeth in his heart. And that's where Larry Burkett gets to the point. He says, you know what? The 10% may be a guide, but it's not a New Testament law like it was an Old Testament rule or law. But every man should give as he purposeth in his heart. So you need to pray about what you give to the Lord. Because the Lord looks at your heart. God, do you want me to give pledge 10% this year? Then if he says yes, well then you better put 10% down on your pledge card. But if he says no, I want you to give 11%. Well, then you better put 11% down. And it makes no matter to me, by the way, as the pastor, because I trust that God is going to meet all of our financial needs this year anyway. Whether you do your part or not, and if you don't do your part, you'll do your part, or you'll get extra blessings because you give more than somebody else you didn't get. So I'm, I'm fully confident that the church will have all of its bills met, and then some. So I'm not worried about that. I'm trying to help you understand that I want you individually to have a blessing this year coming up, and I want you to do whatever God guide you to do by the Holy Spirit and give whatever He tells you you need to give this year. That's the important thing. We're going to stop there but next week we're going to pick that up again and if you want to read ahead, I'm going to talk about the parable of the talents in Matthew chapter 25, it's verses 14 to 30, so if you'd like to read ahead about that, that's where we're going to pick it up next week. We're going to talk about those people who idolize money, and those people who invest it wisely, those people who don't. So be in prayer about that, and be in prayer about your pledge again this next year. All the church members, we would encourage you to submit something. If you can give a dollar a month, and that's all you can afford, then praise God. Give it cheerfully, and God will bless you, believe it or not. As much as He will bless the person who gives a thousand dollars a month, cheerfully. The key there is to do it cheerfully, and do it as unto the Lord, understanding that it's not your money in the first place. It belongs to God. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your word and your blessings this morning. We thank you for the encouragement. And Lord, uh, we know that sometimes this can be an, a difficult topic and an uncomfortable topic, but Lord, I just pray that, uh, these, that everybody here understands that this is not something where I'm trying to condemn anybody for what they give or what they don't give. This is strictly between every individual and God Almighty. And so I pray, Lord, that you would just impress upon our members this year to pledge whatever it is that you want them to pledge, and that we will be good stewards of whatever it is that they give to us as encouraged by you, Lord. So we may uh, develop a, a wise budget, that we may keep our expenses within our own spending patterns and, and not spend more than we have. So, Father, we pray that you would just help us along those guidelines. But we know, Lord, that we are your possession, that uh, we are the crown jewel, uh, that you created us in your image. Nothing else was created in your image, not even the angels, but us. And that's how much you love us, how much you sacrifice for us. And Lord, I pray that we can just give a little bit of a sacrifice of our income back in return. We ask, Lord, for your continued blessing on the service and the, the communion service to follow as well. But Lord, if there's somebody here this morning who is yet to make that initial decision to turn their heart, the most precious thing that we have that God wants is our heart this morning. And if you're willing to do that, if you're willing to surrender your heart to the Lord this morning, we invite you to accept Jesus Christ 
as Lord and Savior, to proclaim Him as the only begotten Son of God and be a blessing to others. We invite you to make that decision now and to join us as we sing and uh, allow us to pray with you and to welcome you into the family of God. It will literally change your entire life all the way through eternity. Thank you for hearing our prayers this morning, Lord, in Jesus' name.